Welcome back to the Foundry's YouTube channel. We're so happy that you decided to connect with us to see what God is doing in and through our church. If you want to stay connected throughout the week, please like us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Without further ado, let's dive into the series I'm so excited about called Believe. We are going to start out today, I want to start out by telling you a story uh, from my childhood where it was very traumatic, so because of this event, I avoid a certain thing. See, growing up in the wilderness of West Rent, can you picture that with me? It's West Rent, very different than East Rent, right? At the age of 10, uh, me and my sister had a garden growing up, and we were in charge of weeding it and uh, watering it. We plant carrots and potatoes and corn, um, and we just had a blast in this garden. We took a lot of responsibility in this garden. So there'd be a lot of days in the summer when it's dry that we'd have to carry buckets of water out to the garden, which was about 100 yards from the house. And we, I did one of these days. I was doing this alone, and I was carrying buckets, and um, I was off a week at that point too. Um, so it'd be like f two gallon buckets, not actually five gallons, like you're probably picturing. So I'd be carrying these buckets out, and I get out to the garden, and I see there's something rustling in the garden. I'm like, well, "What is that?" And something's in my garden. I was quite upset because I had put a ton of time in this, and I noticed this big white creature eating my carrots. And I'm like, that is not acceptable. I get up closer to it, and it just looks at me. It's this big, giant, white creature. It's got these long, black legs and huge feet. And I think, this can't happen. This isn't okay. So I take one of my water buckets, and I throw two gallons of water at it. And it didn't really like that. It started hissing at me. And at that point, it started slowly walking towards me like a big monster would. And then I looked, and I'm like, well, my only option at this point is to throw the bucket at it. So I take the bucket, the empty bucket I have, and just huck the bucket at it. And then it started to get more upset, right? So it started running towards me. And I realized at this point, this is the end for me. This is how I go out. I get eaten by a giant white beast. And I run, run home as quick as I could. I run to the house. And I was 10, so give me a little bit of grace. But I was weeping at this point. I was crying. I was really upset. This thing was about to eat me. And I run into the house, and my mom's like, what's, what's going on? What's wrong? This swan is in my garden, right? I, I was super upset. She's like, we've never seen a swan on our property ever, and there's a swan in the garden eating carrots. That doesn't make any sense. And I'm just weeping. I'm really upset. And I walk her out to the garden, and of course, there is no swan there. And the swan had, I say, disappeared. I don't think my mom to this day thinks that there was ever a swan there. She doesn't believe me. But I still, to this day, avoid swans. I do not like swans. Even the swan rides at Michigan Adventure, right, where they just paddle out. I'm like, yep, not even dealing with those types of things. Right? <laughs> there are things that we avoid, right? Whether they're re as ridiculous as that, um, or there's things in scripture that we sometimes tend to avoid. And over the past few weeks, we've spent some time in the prophecies talking about some things that we tend to avoid that we're kind of frightened of sometimes. Uh, one of those was the, the image and prophecy of Ezekiel with the dry bones. And Eric talked about how Ezekiel spoke to these bones and these bones started rattling together, right? And tendons appeared onto them. And there's this really interesting imagery that, that our minds don't really even like to think about. So we just avoid those because we don't know how to answer some of those types of questions. We also tend to avoid revelation, right? Don't we tend to avoid revelation because of some of this almost heavenly imagery that's coming out of this book? See, what I want you to understand as we go through this is that just because it's frightening or just because we want to avoid it doesn't mean that it's not true. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't believe what is in those things. So I'm excited for this next series because we're not going to avoid those things. We're going to be diving into Revelation and spending some time in the first uh, few chapters of the Bible, specifically talking about the seven churches. And we'll be looking closely at those things and the prophecies that were spoke to these seven churches. But first, what is Revelation? Right? What does Revelation even mean? 
And if you look it up in the Greek language, Revelation is trans, uh, kind of translated as a, apocalypsis. And you can kind of hear apocalypse come out of that, right? If you think about apocalypse, which you would think this book we would spend a lot of time in because we're kind of enamored as a culture with end time stuff, right? There's books written about end times. There's shows about end times. There's a show, Doomsday Preppers, right? Has any of you seen that show before, right? It's where they they get this giant box that's um, like nuclear war proof and they put it deep into the ground and they put canned goods in there and all these different things that they can survive for years and years in this tiny little box just in case the end of the world comes, right? We have shows about that and people are enamored with that. We also have like zombie apocalypse shows, right? Any of you like, yeah, I do watch those ones. Yes, uh, I've got one brave soul. Thank you, right? We, we watch those shows and we, we're fascinated with some of those things. And whether you actually think that those things are going to happen or not, you all know that friend that you're going to go to that house if that zombie apocalypse happens because they have way too much ammunition in their house. You're like, I'll be safe there for sure. I'm going to go just bunker down there. Right? We, we think about these things. We talk about it. We watch shows about it. And when it comes to revelation, the words of Jesus' revelation, of us and we avoid it because that's too much for us. So the question is, why do we avoid it? Right? Why do we go through the scriptures, we go through the gospels and most of the New Testament and then stop at Revelation and go back to the gospels because those words about Jesus are comforting and we can handle those words? Why do we avoid it? See, maybe we're worried about being able to understand it. Right? It is confusing. There is some weird imagery. Maybe we're worried about just not knowing what it is. Uh, Eric had a really good example a few weeks ago about George Washington, right? And the imagery about George Washington, if you took that man from the olden days, right, and brought him into today and brought him to the IMAX theater and had him watch Star Wars, right, he would just be blown away by it and then sending him right back to the troops and say, explain to the troops what you've just seen, right? He would explain things, but are the troops even going to be able to comprehend what he's seen? Is he even going to have the words to speak that the troops are going to understand. No, like that's that's just going to be hard to do. See, in the same way, I was at a, a Christmas uh, party this past Christmas and we played charades. I love charades. And uh, one of my friends gets up and it's guys versus girls. One of you gets up and he pulls a card out and he reads it and then we start the clock, right? And if you don't know anything about charades, it's where you have to act it out until people guess it. Okay, so we're going to do this with me. I, he pulls it out and he does this. What do you think this is? Moose, reindeer, Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer, right? We were shouting all of these things out. No, no, and he kept going like this, and very determined. This, this is what we were going to get. And it, this went on for a minute, and we kept shouting out different creatures with, with horns, and we just, no, he got more and more frustrated. The time ran out, he threw it down, and we're like, what were you? And he's like, I was an elf. And we're like, you were doing this. He's like, no, oh, I meant to do this. And we're like, oh, my word, right? He knew exactly what he was trying to do, right? He knew what was on that card. He could imagine exactly what that thing looked like. But when he was trying to get it across, we, we didn't know what he had seen on that paper, right? And we didn't know the image that was in his mind. And yet he was so clear about it. So John is going to describe some things in Revelation, some of these images that he has seen in a way that we can't even comprehend. In the same way of the charades or George Washington, there's just some heavenly images that are probably not going to make sense to our minds, but that doesn't mean we can avoid it. Right? That doesn't mean we shouldn't believe the words that are in there. Because John starts this prologue, by saying, blessed are the people who hear it and put it on their hearts, right? So there is reason about that. We can't avoid revelation because it's scary, because it's confusing, or we're worried about understanding it. So let's get right into it. Let's start by reading reading Revelation 1, 1 through 3. So the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw. 
That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So there's a few things going on in this passage, Um, and it's a little bit different than most books because there's a few different kind of right, it's not different writers, but different images that are going to come across. So one of them is John. Okay, so we're going to be talking about John and the visions that he saw. And the second is the word of God. So Revelation kind of pulls from different parts of the Bible and has those in the book itself. And then the other is referring to the prophecies that were written in the Bible and and prophecies from Jesus Christ himself. So if you have a New Testament that's a red letter Bible, right? Some of these words are almost what Jesus would say, right? These exact words that Jesus would say. So we've got three different kinds of things that are written in here. But first, let's talk about uh, that first part, right? Blessed are those who hear it. Blessed are those who put it on their heart. See, fortunately, John doesn't say, blessed are those who understand this book, Because if it were that, I'd be like, yep, it's not even going to happen. Let's not waste our time with it, right? But he said, blessed are those who read this book and put it on their heart. See, there's going to be difficult things, but he doesn't ask us to understand it. There's going to be heavenly imagery that is going to be not necessarily too much for us to handle, but we, we, we can't even comprehend the heavenly realm in some of these things. See, one other thing I want you to take note of, and maybe you've caught this already, is in the first part... It says, what must soon take place. And then the end, it says, because the time is near. So maybe that's throwing some red flags off for you because this was written about 2,000 years ago. Shortly after Jesus had died on the cross, this this, uh, letter was going out to different cities. So 2,000 years ago. And if it's saying the time is near, right, isn't that like... uh, shouldn't this have already happened then if it's 2,000 years later? What, what are we still doing with this? If it's, is it not true because it's not happened yet? See, what's fascinating is shortly in the ancient Greek um, actually means quickly or suddenly coming to pass. All right, how many of you have ever walked up behind someone who doesn't know you're there? And then you grab their shoulders and shriek really loud. And then they let out noises that you didn't know they could make because they're so, they're so terrified of what's happening. It's that moment that suddenly that they can't even control themselves. They didn't know you were there, but suddenly it happens. Right? The second coming is not going it, to, it, we're not referring to when it's going to happen. We're referring to how it is going to happen. When this moment comes, it is going to pass and happen suddenly, right? It's not going to happen. It's not about how or not about when, but how. See, before we talk about how it's going to happen, let's spend some time on who is actually writing this book. So uh, we're going to continue in verse 9, and then we'll jump back in just a bit. But in verse 9, it says this, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom, And patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So John is writing this book. John is one of Jesus' disciples. He was the one who wrote the Gospel of John and also 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So he spent a lot of time with Jesus and he did a lot of ministry following Jesus. And this is that same man who wrote that. Now, he says he's on the island of Patmos. And what you need to know about that, it was actually a prison camp that Rome had set up. Now, by this time, by this time that it was written, all of the disciples had been killed. And John was the only disciple remaining at this point. And Rome was kind of sick of what all of the disciples were doing. They had been spreading the gospel from town to town and creating a lot of ruckus and a lot of movement by these early Christians. And so they decided to just send John to this remote island. So if you think of Patmos, think of it similar to like the Alcatraz Island, where it's a prison camp. They don't need walls because it's an island and you could swim, but you're not going to make it to the nearest shore, 
right? They just had to kind of drop them off on this Patmos Island and they didn't need to worry about them ever again. See, let's continue from verse four. So John, the man we were just talking about, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And look at this imagery here as we read this. Look, he is coming, uh, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. See, I don't know if you're anything like me, but when I picture the end times, when I think of that glorious second coming, I picture something similar to the shepherds, right? When, when the angels came down and announced the birth of Jesus Christ, right? It's that moment where the heavens open and the angels are singing and there's light and there's the trumpet sounding and everyone's happy, right? Uh, that's what I picture. And when I read this, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him, that, that doesn't really fit the picture I had in my mind. So what, what's the mourning mean? Why, why are they saying it's gonna, they're going to mourn? And diving into this a little deeper, I have a few ideas that might, might uh, be possible answers to this. There's three different groups of people. See, we'll have one group of people that are the people who reject Jesus. They're going to mourn because they rejected Jesus for their life. They're the type of people that say they don't need forgiveness, that they don't need a savior, that they're doing things just fine on their own. They don't want to be held accountable to anyone. They are in charge and they're going to do it their way. They're not going to worry about some higher power. And they're going to mourn because they're going to realize what they've been missing this whole time. So that's group of people, number one. Second group is going to be the group that has this painful realization of what our sins did to Jesus Christ. Right, there's going to be a moment when Jesus comes down and there's going to be a painful realization of what we've done, that we can see the nails, nail-pierced hands. Right? I, th- I think of this moment, well, because we, we know what we've done to Jesus. Right? We know the sins we've committed got bore on him, but do we fully understand it? Right? I remember a moment when I was getting married, I had Jalen's friends on the right of me and um, all my buddies on the left of me, and I had the pastor next to me, and Jalen hadn't come down yet, right? It's, there's so much anticipation, and I can see her and her dad walk, start turning the corner and walk down the aisle, and at that point, I just lost it. Like, I couldn't contain myself anymore. And it wasn't that, like, oh, the groom shed a single tear. That's so nice. No, it was that you should get the man a box of Kleenex because he's just weeping up there. Right? I, w- I was just weeping because I realized that our life was going to be changed forever because of this moment right here. See, it wasn't that I ever questioned the love Jalen had for me. I never questioned. I, I knew how beautiful she was going to look. Right? All of those things I knew But when I saw her, I realized in that moment that this is going to be so much more different than I ever realized. Right? The second group of people are going to have a full realization of what our sins did to Jesus Christ. See, I love how it's worded in Zechariah 12.10. It says, And I will pour pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierce. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. This is the group of people who fully realize what Jesus has done for them. The third group, I think, are very similar to the second group. And they're going to be people that look up and realize what Jesus has done, but then they're going to, I feel like they're going to look down and mourn because their chances are over. The chances of talking to that coworker about having a conversation about their faith, right? That chance is gone. See, it's a chance of having friends that you knew were going down the wrong path 
and you didn't step in and tell them, no, you're, you're doing the wrong thing here. You got to come to Jesus in these moments. There's no more chances to have those conversations. And even moments thinking about family, right? We don't want to be those family members that are always talking about Jesus and always forcing someone to choose and have a good conversation about who Jesus is and what they're doing in our lives so we don't take those chances that we have. And then there's going to be a moment that's going to happen suddenly that that chance is no longer going to come. All right, how often are we asking ourselves, I'll, I'll talk to that person next week or when they get their life together here, and then I'll start bringing up conversations. But we read earlier that that suddenly moment is going to happen, right? And we won't have any more chances after that. You see, there's these three groups of people, and all of those people are going to mourn because of that realization of who Jesus is, what he's done, and realizing that these moments that we've been taken for granted are no longer around. We're now going to be with Jesus Christ, and it's going to be a glorious thing, but there's still going to be mourning there. So do you see why sometimes it almost feels like Eric is like yelling from the stage to get out into the world, get out into your community, talk to your friends about who Jesus Christ is. See, do you see why we talk so urgently about the gospel and the importance of sharing that with people? And do you see why there, there's often so much energy in this room? And I think it's because so many of you realize that, realize that time is short for the lost, right? Time is short. We never know when that moment, that sudden moment is going to happen. You see, if you believe anything about what I said today, if you catch anything, understand that we cannot avoid what the scriptures say about this. And this may feel like a lot of do's and a lot of don'ts, but do not avoid the scriptures. Do not avoid revelation. But don't go into revelation expecting to be entertained with it by the imagery that comes up. It's not like one of the zombie shows. It's not like doomsday preppers. These are moments that are real, right? This is the word of God. This is the gospel. And revelation is conclusion to that story, right? The whole Bible is one story. There is a theme throughout the whole thing, and Revelation is that conclusion. Have any of you wondered what the audio blips on the backstage were, right? This is woven throughout all of Scripture, including Revelation. God says this throughout all of Scripture, I love you. Right? It does not stop in Revelation. Revelation may have some interesting imagery that we don't understand, but that doesn't mean God isn't screaming, I love you, right? and I'm coming back for you. See, Revelation is the finale when we finally get to realize all of the things that Jesus Christ has done for us. And there are going to be mysteries that we don't understand. There's going to be things that we'll never understand until we're with him at the pearly gates. Right, I love how Ansem of Canterbury said this in a quote, I do, not under, I do not seek to understand in order that I may believe, but I believe in order that I may understand. For of this I am sure, that if I did not believe, or if I did not believe, I would not understand. Right? It doesn't start with understanding. It doesn't start by looking through Revelation and thinking, okay, I just got to understand this and then I'll believe. It's the opposite. It's starting with believing that the words in there are true, that the words are from Jesus Christ himself and that they're prophecies that are going to be true. You see, over the next seven weeks, we're going to be in Revelation. We're going to be spending most of our time in the seven churches. And these seven churches were very real places. These seven churches where places like Ephesus and Philadelphia and all of these places are more than just in the Bible. If you ever think, well, they're just stories in the Bible. No, there's historical evidence and tons of history books that say what was written, that these books are real, that these places are real, that the events that happened to these places are real. See, these letters are 2,000 years old to places that most of them no longer exist anymore. 
But that doesn't mean that those words can't be relevant for us today. So the question I have for you is this. Do you believe? Do you believe? And if you do, be here. Be here for these seven weeks as we look closer at what these seven churches encountered and the prophecies that Jesus laid on their hearts. See, take every chance you get to spread the good news of Christ. Do not avoid this. Because we know that that time could come and it could happen suddenly and then there's going to be no more chances. Right? This, ha- this is going to happen suddenly. I'm calling you to believe. But that means that it can't just stay in this room. It's going out into the community. It's going out and talking to your friends and your coworkers and your family about what is important in your life. I'm calling you to believe and dive into this series with us. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this beautiful day and I thank you for the conversations we could have today about the last book of the Bible in Revelation. And I thank you for the words that Jesus gave to John and the images he gave to him to help us get a better idea of what is happening in these seven churches. And I ask that as we look at these over the next few weeks, that you help us realize that these aren't just old churches, that these words were just for them. I ask that you put those words on our heart as well and help us find a way to relate these to our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to watch this week's message. If you're looking for a way to prepare for next week, click the link below in the description box. There is where you will find devotions. Now devotions are a crucial part of the Foundry's weekly rhythm. I hope this message has been encouraging, but also challenging for you. And we'd love to see you again next week.